Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise, his greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another, they tell of your mighty acts, they speak of the glorious splendour of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name for ever and ever. Those words from the Psalms remind us not only of the greatness of our God, but our God has been with God's people for generation after generation. So can I welcome you again to our NWBA online act of worship this morning. I know that we are welcoming churches who are coming together in these acts of worship from the Wirral in Laird Street, in New Brighton, in Wrexham, in Latchford, in, in Warrington, in Tanterdon, in Barrow, in Lee and Hope, Liverpool. And I'm sure I've missed some out, but if you are watching these as a church, please do let us know that you're joining with us so that we can share our greetings with you. And also those of you who are joining us as individuals, we welcome you in God's name. And as we gather together from very many different parts not only of our northwestern region but way way beyond we come together as God's people we come together because now is the time to worship
endless God. Every minute, every moment, every day is a moment to worship you because all the honour and glory is due to your name. And we worship you and we acknowledge that when every word that we can think of has been used, when every description of you has been explored, when every expression of your love and every example of your goodness has been declared, when our words and our imaginations and our praises have reached their limit, there is still so, so much more to who you are and what you are. And we give you thanks that we can worship you wherever we find ourselves at the moment. You're not confined to any space, you're not contained in any ritual, for you are present everywhere. And it is your gracious presence with us that makes our worship possible. So help us to be open to that presence, heighten our senses and stir our hearts to know that you are with us as we seek to make ourselves present to you. And we thank you that in Jesus, you became present in this world's history, not only to be our inspiration and our example, but also to be our saviour, to put right the wrongs that stand between us and our eternity. And loving God, as we gather, we acknowledge our need of a saviour, because even if we can hide our shortcomings from others, we cannot hide them from ourselves and we cannot hide them from you. But we give you thanks that we don't need to hide those things away because in your grace and your mercy and your endless love, you grant us forgiveness and you make us righteous and you make us what we can never become in our own strength or through our own resolve. And so we come to worship you. We come with grateful hearts. We come with open hands. And by your spirit, we pray that you will not only inhabit this act of worship, but that you will inhabit the lives that we live in its wake. Be with us in our gathering together and be with us as we follow the many and varied paths of our different life journeys when this act of worship has taken its course. Speak to us, we pray, as we focus ourselves again on you encourage us and equip us and may all that we speak and think and do be worthy of the one in whose name we come together this we pray through jesus christ our lord amen we've been hugely blessed over many weeks now by the music team from Lim baptist church and uh, we're going to be led now in a traditional hymn but in quite a contemporary way by jonathan and claire all creatures of our god and king of a God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh praise Him, hallelujah, that our burning sun with golden beam, that our silver moon with softer gleam, 
I'm delighted that we're joined today by Rose Wietedick, who has been community minister in Ellesmere Port now for quite a while as, as part of one of our NWBA uh, partnerships with Urban Expression. But Rose, we'll let you tell us a bit about what you do. Tell us a bit about your community ministry. Yeah, so I am an ordained Baptist minister and for most of my uh, adult life I've been part of a Baptist church in Chester. But eight years ago, Dirk and I moved to Ellesmere Port and I became community minister, which means I don't have a church building, but I work in the community, so in all kinds of buildings, often coffee shops, often other churches, working in partnership with other churches, in care homes, in um, extra care residential homes. So doing a wide variety of things, really, that mostly out there with people who wouldn't normally find themselves in a church on a Sunday. Now that, that's quite an interesting perspective on things because obviously for a lot of us at the moment it's uh, we don't we do have church buildings but we can't get into them yeah. and uh, that's affected how we do church. How has your ministry been affected by all that's happened in the last few weeks? Yeah it's been hugely uh, affected um, a lot of what we do happens in our home so none of that has been possible at all and it looks like that that's not going to be possible for quite some time to come so that's had a big effect on what we do and um, one of the things we do is we have a Tuesday night kind of bible study uh, for want of a better word and some of those people that come to that just don't have the facility to zoom or the ability to zoom so we made a decision that we wouldn't do anything regular because some people would just be totally left out. So the way that we've been keeping in touch with people really is um, by phone calls, by cards, old fashioned letters, um, by taking people flowers. And it's been an interesting process. At the beginning, I really wanted to join the effort and to be one of the, the heroes of COVID at the beginning, but realised that actually we're carers for my 90 year old dad. And so we had to be careful. So it's been a bit of a humbling process at times, if I'm honest, not being, being able to be out there helping, but just keeping in touch with people as best we can. And finding that in doing that, some relationships have deepened because you talk to people one to one on the phone so yeah, and what will be left after we come out of this is yet to be seen. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really brilliant that you've given us that sort of little insight into things, because I know obviously I've been over to see some of the really quite creative things that you've been doing over the years. And uh, yeah, I guess in many respects it must have curtailed. Are, are there any particular ways we can pray for you and pray for the ministry at Ellesmere Port in the days and the weeks ahead? Yeah, just pray that we would have wisdom to know what to take up. One of the um, opportunities is that I'm talking with um, local faith leaders and the police and um, council workers about perhaps setting up a listening project because I think one of the, the things that will be necessary is for people to tell their stories and how that will happen, we don't know yet, but perhaps pray for that really, that we find a way forward because I think deep listening is going to be really important. That's great, Rose. And it, it's always, whenever I talk to you, I always come away with another idea and another thought. So, so thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, as we pray for you, I'm sure many others of us will be thinking, do you know, that's something we might want to do too. Well, we want to pray for you, but you're going to lead us in our prayers for the world this morning. So uh, thank you okay. for doing that. And we'll place ourselves in your hands. Okay. So let's pray together. God who feeds your hungry people, we bring you our prayers for our church and our world. We pray for those who experience physical hunger, for farmers surviving on meagre crops and low prices, for mothers struggling to feed their children, for families getting by on cheap food and cut price bargains, for those working with food banks seeking to provide for the most vulnerable at this time. God who feeds your people, help us to work for a fairer sharing of the world's resources. 
We pray for those for whom food means difficulty rather than enjoyment, for those who cannot eat because of illness, for those who experience eating disorders or a loathing of their bodies, for those who eat to mask loneliness or unhappiness. God who feeds your people, help us to delight in the simplicity of food. We pray for those whose hunger is not physical, for those longing for companionship and friendship, for those searching for meaning and purpose, for those reaching out for an end to grief and pain. We pray for those who have spent the last months alone with no one to listen to them. God who feeds your people, help us to welcome others with the good news of your gospel. Help us to be those who reach out to the lonely with a willingness to listen deeply to their experiences. And oh God, we are part of that great crowd of people who are learning what it means to abide in your love. We thank you that we are not alone in our journey, but from the beginning of human experience, right through scripture, right through the stories of faithful people, you have invited us to travel with you in this journey of salvation. We recognise the journey takes us through desert landscapes, sometimes dotted with oases, sometimes arid, dry and forbidding as far as the eye can see, through beautiful landscapes filled with water, trees and hills, where all creation cries Alleluia, through urban landscapes noisy with change, yet a place where nothing really changes. We offer you our journey and pray that while you lead us to where we need to go, you'll help us to be fully present today to your spirit, ever beckoning, ever calling, ever inviting to life in all its fullness. And we offer to you the faith journey of those we know, praying for them your peace and hope and an ever deepening awareness of your love and life. God who feeds your people, renew us with courage, trust and vision for the future. Amen. Amen. Rose, thank you so much for sharing with us this morning and uh, obviously that prayer which has picked up on many of the themes that we're going to be picking up in our scripture reading shortly. But one of the things that I've tried to emphasise throughout this period of COVID lockdown is that we need to try and seek to serve God in the midst of our here and now, not just wait for things to be over. And some of the possibilities and the challenges and the realities of that are very much captured in our next hymn. We've been given permission to use it by the team at Wakefield Cathedral who have produced it. You'll probably recognise it as quite a well-known traditional hymn, but the words by the canon presenter there, which in Baptist speak is the worship leader, a canon Leah Vasey Saul, really captures so much of what our present situation is about. I personally have found it really inspiring and I hope that it inspires you too.
The reading is Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Jesus feeds the 5,000. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men, besides women and children. My thanks to Katie for our scripture reading today, and in fact the whole Baptist Voice team for the way they've brought our readings to us week by week. And if you are a regular watcher of these services and sermons, you may remember that when we began to explore the seven parables recorded for us in Matthew chapter 13, I suggested to you that these were more than just a collection of insightful stories kind of randomly put together, but served as something of a commentary on the events and the narratives that had been recorded in the earlier chapters. So, for example, we'd seen Jesus sharing the message of God's kingdom in religious meeting houses and in people's homes and on mountainsides. And then we kind of noticed that that wasn't that dissimilar to a farmer going out to sow his seed in a field. And of course, what we were reminded of in that story was that the fruitfulness of this particular enterprise was not so much dependent on the location of the soil or who owned the soil, but the quality of the soil. And and this kind of underlined a key aspect of the message of Jesus. The kingdom of God is not defined and contained by traditional religious locations and rituals, but is a much more dynamic and living interaction that can be encountered in everyday life. And this is a, a message of particular relevance in a situation where our access to traditional religious activities and routines has become significantly curtailed in recent days. So stories about everyday life are quite helpful to us because that's how what we're having to do at the moment is get our heads around everyday life. And, and a challenge for us, of course, is, is to do that with an everyday world whose uncertainty and volatility is often summed up by the now ubiquitous phrase, new normal. How do we express our identity as citizens of God's kingdom in the new normal? How do we seek God's kingdom? How do we exemplify or point others towards God's kingdom within this changing world of ours? Well, in many respects, we can see Gospels like Matthew and the other narratives of the New Testament as offering us good news because they highlight the fact that our faith is not contained in a set of habits and rituals that we need to cling on to at all costs, but it can be discovered in a whole variety of circumstances. And the people who struggled to understand and to accept and to follow Jesus were the people who could not let go of the past in the face of the new normal that Jesus had come to proclaim. So please hear me. I'm not therefore saying that everything that's happened in the last six months or so is a direct action of God to reinstall the Christian faith. As I have said before, none of us can claim to know the mind of God. But what I do feel confident in saying is that we have a faith that is not threatened by changing context or shifting realities or new normals. And as I outlined at the time, 
I sense that the parables of Matthew chapter 13 show us this reality by defining God's kingdom by values and behaviours and ideas, not by a fixed set of locations and rituals and power structures. But anyway, I am not here to preach a sermon on the narrative that comes before Matthew chapter 14. We are here to look at Matthew chapter 14 itself. But the reason that I wanted to make that our starting point is because I would argue that not only do those parables of chapter 13 offer a commentary on the events that have gone before, but they also set the stage for what follows. And if you stop to think about it for a moment, as we read the story of, of the feeding of, of, of probably around 10,000 people, if you assume that there would have been as many women and children there as there were men, then you can hear the echoes of those parables as the story unfolds. For a kickoff, just take a look at the menu, bread and fish. And in the preceding parables, we have one about bread, the leaven that it's worked into the loaf to make it rise, and one about fish, the catch in the dragnet that needs to be sorted and stored on the quayside. And when we recall the parables of the leaven and the mustard seed, we remember that the key message was of how God's kingdom is one where small things can achieve a great deal. And then we're presented with a story where thousands of people are fed with just five loaves and two fish. And then, as I think more broadly about the circumstances surrounding this miracle, we might recall those stories about the treasure finder and the pearl merchant, both of whom recognised the value of what they had found and were prepared to make obtaining it more important than just about anything else. And then we think again about the crowd of 10,000 people who seem to have just dropped everything to spend the day with Jesus. 10,000 people at a time when the population of towns and cities was nothing like it is today. That's an awful lot of people. That's an awful lot of bread that didn't get baked and fields that didn't get weeded or watered or seeds that didn't get sold or merchants that didn't open their trading stalls. So in this gathered crowd, we see something of what Jesus had been talking about in the stories before too. People who caught a glimpse of something, caught a glimpse of something in Jesus that they were prepared to allow to take over the whole of their attention and focus. Now, as we look at that in more detail, we can recognise that this feeding is the culmination of a day that began when Jesus started to heal those who were sick. And what I would encourage us to also notice is that simple phrase in verse 13. Jesus had compassion on them. What kicked off the event was, was not the expectations or the spiritual shopping lists of the crowd, but the compassion of Jesus. But I think that there is something really significant in that moment. So forgive me if I'm labouring the point a bit, but let's just stay with it and recap. Jesus is saying, you can and you will find the kingdom of God in unexpected places, in everyday moments expressed through behaviours and actions and priorities, not so much religious rituals and hierarchies. And remember that the whole gospel story is lived out against a backdrop of opposition and disapproval from the religious powers that be. And then we're presented with a scene of a crowd of people that is riddled with echoes of those descriptions of God's kingdom. And what brings that crowd together and what places Jesus at its centre is compassion and making a priority of those who are sick and inflicted with disease. And here we are today, looking at this story in the context of a society that has been utterly turned upside down and inside out through the impact of a disease and a desire to protect the vulnerable and to make sure that we have got the capacity to try to heal those who are inflicted by it. Now again, I want to avoid the trap of over literalizing everything and as I've said, there are though echoes of the parables of the kingdom in the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And there are echoes of the story of the feeding of the 5,000 
in our experiences today. Now, I don't think, therefore, we should be trying to draw hard and fast lines between them. Because if we do, we'll end up with a vision of God's kingdom that can only be lived out during a worldwide pandemic. And my point is that God's kingdom is not contained by human circumstances, that God's kingdom can be found in every human circumstance. But there are things happening around us at the moment within which we might see traces of God's kingdom. So for me, the power and the relevance of this story is not to try and create some hard and fast apocalyptic explanation of what's happening, but to simply say to us, we can no less live as faithful followers of Jesus in the here and now as we could in whatever life meant for us six or 12 months ago. And we can no less live as faithful followers of Jesus in whatever new normals come our way in the future. And sometimes we can be reminded that we're called to love our neighbour by sitting in church and listening to a sermon on Luke chapter 10. That's the story of the Good Samaritan, for those of you that uh, don't have an index of the Bible planted in your heads, which would be me too. Um, but also we can sometimes live out the call to love our neighbour by sticking a face mask on and so that we protect others and going out and doing a shopping for the person in our street who's shielding. And I don't want to argue, therefore, that every response we make to the present circumstances is in and of itself the coming of the kingdom of God. But what I want to emphatically say is that we can live out and express our faith in the present circumstances, even though they may be very different to the ones that we are used to. Those opportunities to live out our faith have not gone away. And in the events of that afternoon, which Matthew's gospel has recorded for us, as the people made space for the afflicted and the unwell to find their way to Jesus, as people sat waiting in the sunshine, as they ate this unexpected buffet of bread and fish, they were experiencing the kingdom of God. But one of the images that I have not carried forward from Matthew chapter 13 as yet is that one of being discerning. And as I've argued at the time, one of the key messages that I think Jesus conveys is the importance of recognising what really matters. Whether that's knowing the difference between wheat and weeds, whether it's being able to tell the good fish from the bad, or recognising the difference between a pearl that's worth selling your entire stock for and one that isn't. Learn to recognise the signs of my kingdom. That seems to be what Jesus is saying. And of course, the people that he said that to more than anyone else is that inner circle that we call his disciples. They're the ones who were particularly encouraged to look out for the signs of God's kingdom and to invest their all in them. And that raises a really interesting point for me, because they're the one group of people in this story that really didn't seem to get that. Let's remind ourselves of, of what it says in verse 14. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. So here's me, waxing lyrical about how the feeding of this crowd is laced with images and signs of the kingdom of God. And if the disciples had had their way, it was an event that would never have even happened. Now, before we rush to give the disciples a hard time, let's remember that we're looking at this story with the benefit of hindsight. They weren't. And yet it's easy to argue that all that teaching and explaining has just completely gone over their heads, but they were human. And I'm not convinced that in the same circumstances, I wouldn't have done the same. I'm not sure that I would have immediately seen this as an opportunity to test out the logic of the parable of the mustard seed and to see if I could feed 10,000 people with a single picnic. And, and they were no doubt tired and ready for a break at the end of a long day. And I guess that if Jesus had been teaching and telling more stories, perhaps too, they were armed with a whole new set of questions and interpretations to ask him about. So no, I don't want to be too critical of them. But the fact that they have allowed their story to be told would say to me that they would want us to learn from it. And so let's try to do that as we confront our own set of circumstances, a set of circumstances about which we don't yet have any hindsight. 
How can we live as the people of God in the midst of the world in which we are now finding ourselves living? And the first thing that I would want us to notice as we look at this story is that we are called to be a people of compassion. When the disciples saw the crowd, they saw a problem that needed to be got rid of. When Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion. And that's what the storyteller remembers. Now, it's easy enough for us today to bring some big theological themes into this story. We can recognise the parallels between the teaching of Jesus and the events that happen next. And we might even be able to delve into some of the cultural images of the day that spoke of how when the Messiah came, people would be fed in the desert. And, and we could perhaps therefore recognise that uh, Jesus is offering us here the opportunity to explore some deeper truths about who he is and what his kingdom is all about. But let's not lose sight in all of that of a more simple reality. You know, Jesus may have had those things in mind too. But what we are told here is not that Jesus saw the crowd and recognised an ideal opportunity to demonstrate the realities that had been talking about in the previous chapter. We're not told that Jesus saw the crowd and recognised a strategic opportunity to emphasise his messiahship. He saw them, we are told, and he had compassion. That's what those who witnessed these events remembered. And that was so evident in Jesus' behaviour that the Gospel writer confidently describes that it's the compassion of Jesus that is the key driver of the events that follows. Now, as religious people, we can become very tempted to try and analyse everything that's going on around us. We can ask questions about what we can learn about the mission of God from present times. And yes, these things do have their place, just as Matthew had a purpose in presenting events in the order and in the way that he did. But let's not become so distracted by those things that we miss the more obvious reality, because the call of God's kingdom at its heart is far more simple and yet far more profound. Live as a people of compassion, follow the example of Jesus and seek to treat those around you with an attitude of love and compassion. And we can be a people of compassion in every circumstance. We can be a people of compassion whether we understand what's going on around us or whether we don't. And when Jesus had compassion and when Jesus responded to that sense of compassion, signs of the kingdom of God at work began to spring up too. And so maybe if we have the same compassion, we might see that happening. And then it seems to me that the second thing that we can learn from this story is that we're called to be a people of generosity. And as is so typical of Jesus, having modelled compassion in his own attitude and response, he actually invites his disciples to become the agents of his generosity. And so he says to them, you give them something to eat. And they reply quite reasonably, we've got nothing but five loaves and two fish. In fact, in one of the other gospel accounts, th this suggests that they even had to scrounge that from a teenage boy in the crowd. But take a moment to live with that phrase. We have nothing but. That's a classic glass half empty, glass half full kind of phrase, isn't it? Do you see what you have or do you see what you don't have? You know, someone shared with me a wonderful anecdote recently of, of a lad who was asked that question. Do you see the glass half full or half empty? And his reply was absolutely brilliant. I'm just glad I've got a glass. Now that to me is a generous attitude. And to me, generosity is not measured by what we have or what we give away but more about our attitude. You don't need to be rich to be generous. In fact, I would argue that generosity is more a state of mind. We can be generous with more than material wealth. We can have a generous spirit. Forgiveness and empathy are gifts of generosity. We can be generous hearted. We can be generous with our time and attention. We can be generous by choosing to listen to someone rather than simply imposing our own outlooks and opinions on them. There are many, many ways in which we can be generous. And of course, when we then also add into that the mathematics of God's kingdom, then the disciples nothing but was enough 
And it was enough because they placed all that they had in the hands of Jesus. Just like nothing but an almost invisible seed can become a nesting place for the birds of the air. Just like nothing but a bit of mouldy old dough can make the difference between a new loaf being light and airy or heavy and flat. Jesus simply invites us to place our nothing but into his hands and then the kingdom begins to appear. So if you're scanning the current horizon and you want to describe your resources as nothing but whatever, the good news is that is all that Jesus needs to work with. So we're called to be a people of compassion and we're called to be a people of generosity. But I want to recognise a more down to earth side of this story too, because as I've already said, the disciples probably were feeling tired and drained by the day's events and they weren't entirely unreasonable in wishing the crowd away. And I know from my own role in supporting those who have leadership or in responsibility in local churches that that too can often be demanding and tiring and we are only human. And of course, the change of events that happened that afternoon placed a whole new set of demands on the shoulders of those disciples. Look at that phrase at the end of the story. They took up the leftover broken pieces, 12 basketfuls. I can't help but feel that the they in that question was the disciples. And the fact that there were 12 basketfuls suggests to me that they were the ones who were left collecting up the rubbish at the end. They were the ones left with the bin bags when everyone else had gone home. Does that sound familiar? But they were part and parcel of making the kingdom of God known. They were part and parcel of making the kingdom of God known as they watched in despair as Jesus broke up this hopelessly inadequate food supply. They were making the kingdom known as they grumbled to one another about how late it was and why the people wouldn't take the hint and leave them alone. They were making the kingdom known as they handed out the food. They were making the kingdom known as their backs ached and their fingers smelled from picking up half eaten bits of fish off the floor. And they probably didn't even recognise at the time that God's kingdom was being revealed through all of that grafting. So, yeah, if you find that aspect of the story easier to relate to than some of the others, then do not despair. Because you may not be able to see how God can be at work in anything that's going on around you at the moment. And you may, may well feel overworked and unappreciated or things might feel very ordinary and down to earth. Or, or perhaps you're just finding the ongoing course of events wearying and bewildering. Or maybe you're a key worker and you're just going flat out at the moment. But it seems to me that one of the things that this story says is, you know, when life feels like that, when that's how things are working out, don't believe for a moment that God's kingdom might not be at work, even in the very things that you are finding a strain and a struggle, which sadly can include picking up other people's rubbish, which is also becoming a very familiar feature of our society at the moment. So, yeah. This is a story of a great miracle. It's a story that goes to the very heart of what God's kingdom is all about. But we can live it out in a very simple and a very straightforward way too. It reminds us that we are called to be a people of compassion. It reminds us that we're called to be a people of generosity. And it reminds us to keep going. Even when we struggle to see the fruits of our labours, just like a farmer keeps on sowing their seed, even when all they can see is birds landing on the footpath and eating it. So, yes, I am sure the day will come when we will look back on present events with all the benefits of hindsight, when we will discover many deep truths about how God has been at work in the midst of things. But for now, let's determine to be compassionate, to be generous to those around us, and perhaps most of all, to keep on going. Well, we could not end a service when we've been thinking about the feeding of the 5,000 with any other hymn but bread of heaven feed me now and evermore. So as we look to our new future and our new normal those words guide me O thou great Jehovah are also particularly important ones for us. So let's share that hymn together.
And so let's pray together. Gracious and compassionate and all providing God, we recognise that the roads that we are being called to follow at the moment are far from familiar and are racked with uncertainty. But we pray that your hand will indeed guide us, that we will know your presence with us and your provision around us. Grant us the faith to walk well in your ways and to encourage others to seek the ways of your kingdom too. And as we seek to live out this calling, may your blessing and your mercy and your peace be with each of us now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Go peaceful in gentleness Through the violence of these days Give freely your tenderness In all your ways Through darkness in troubled times Let holiness be your way Seek wisdom, let faithfulness burn like a flame. God speed you, God lead you, and keep you wrapped around his heart. May you be known by love. Righteous, speak truthfully In a world that's full of greed and lies Show kindness, see everyone Through heaven's eyes God hold you, enfold you And keep you wrapped around his heart may you be known by love may you be known by love